Okay, so yesterday we executed Valiant Shield 2020, uh, day one of free play execution. The significance about free play execution is that it brings together all of the elements that we've practiced the week prior in the scripted vignettes. Uh, we started off with an IEMD uh, law to get the ships postured in the carrier strike group uh, and as to how to defend against air ballistic missile threats, airborne threats, and cruise missiles. Uh, we combine that with a uh, planned deliberate strike uh, in a joint strike vol, and then we followed that up with a JWAS CONOP scenario. What we did yesterday was bring in some of the more advanced system capabilities, particularly the KC-46, which is a part of our ABMS uh, network of solutions. Uh, it has an airborne gateway. It also was being used as an air early warning platform, potentially an airborne command and control node uh, that extends not only the line of sight picture, but also it gives an additional capability to commanders, whether that be air component commanders or maritime component commanders uh, at sea. Uh, the scenario was built to put the KC-46 in the rear area of the carrier strike group to refuel F-22s, that giving that fifth gen uh, capability to the strike group commander to enhance his defense capabilities against those air breathing and cruise missile threats. After the refueling uh, was complete, the airborne early warning system uh, enabled by some of the national technical uh, intelligence agencies was able to cue that aircraft that a threat strike vehicle was inbound, potentially carrying a cruise missile threat. The F-22s then broke contact with the KC-46 to prosecute that threat where they were able to make contact. It was a three ship strike formation. Uh, they were able to kill all the strikers within with range and, and keep the HAVA assets protected. However, they were not able to prevent the release of those cruise missile threats, which then became leaker assets and was it destroyed the home plate and home base where those fighters took off from. Which is a real issue that we are getting our arms wrapped around here uh, is how do we fight with limited spaces and bases in an A2 AD type threat scenario. Uh, General Brown, our previous compact half commander, uh, chose to uh, pursue the agile combat employment concept uh, with, which is heavily logistics uh, fight and, and the situational awareness and ability to command and control assets that are moving throughout the theater and landing at foreign bases and locations and continue to sustain the rhythm of an air tasking order that's supporting component commanders that are on the move fighting in and fighting out of a, an, an A2AD was is the challenge that we try to get our arms wrapped around in this free, free play phase. Okay. Yes, so the MDOC is an experimental organization uh, that supports the Joint All Domain Command and Control Initiative. Uh, the MDOC is the uh, example of capabilities that would be postured in a forward location to enable some of those critical functions. Uh, what we've uh, designed in the current Joint Command, uh, command Campaign Plan for C2 is that those ADOCs, All Domain Operational Centers, will enable small teams such as a a mobile MBMT or what we are using here as the MDOT to focus on a problem centric solution and in this case it is the defense and offensive fires required to prosecute threats in an A2AD environment. So the MDOC scenario is to maintain force accountability on the KC-46 as well as the logistics posture of forward dislocated nodes. So the MDOC in itself is a distributed C2 node that is enabling fighters to be able to land and take off from distributed bases and still be able to rejoin inside the rhythm of the air tasking order. Okay, so the MDOC is an experimental organization uh, for multi-domain operations center. It provides component commanders with the reach back capability for all domain prosecution of fires. Uh, our problem centric focus in this scenario is offense and defensive fires. Much like the extension that the KC-46 provided us with the airborne gateway uh, that links those fifth gen, uh, fifth gen assets and their protected data links into our legacy data links that extends the line of sight 
one of the things we uh, added to the scenario was a ground-based uh, unit that provides command and control from a fixed location with a limited line of sight capability that is extended by the KC-46 gateway. The MDOC is able to support with national technical means. So when the KC-46 is receiving beyond the horizon situational awareness on a threat that is potentially thousands or hundreds of miles away, that information is coming through those exquisite intelligence-based systems that are feeding the MDOC that will feed the picture that is being seen on the KC-46 which is then relayed down to that ground-based unit who otherwise would not have that situational awareness. So our new strategy for the Air Force under General Brown is that we will accelerate change or lose. So our ability to experiment, test, modify, and be agile in an environment that is as challenging as the Indo-PACOM theater is critical to our ability to support our combatants um, and our brethren in a joint force with air power projection that provides the desired effect, which is, may or may not always be lethal effects. So we need to be able to reach across all domains and be able to provide the right balance of air power, space power, and a combined effects as we support the components as they're on the move. So I, I cannot explain the full uh, complement of that uh, I will say that we have partial success, not full success. Uh, the report received from the KC-46 was a gadget bent, uh, which is a standard term and phrase that we use from a command and control uh, aspect. Uh, but the, de the full details of what that entails, I'll allow them to speak to that. So I, I think that um, the background of what we're doing here and kind of the, the foundation of it is uh, we realize that we have to have global integrated operations across the joint force and across the DOD enterprise in order for cross-combatant command coordination to occur. Uh, Indo-PACOM in and of itself will not support a fight in this theater without cross-combatant command and global integrated operations from those specific forces such as Cybercom, uh, Spacecom, Space Force, and Air Forces working together to provide the support that we need. Um, the Joint All Domain Command and Control initiative that the chairman has set out on uh, requires us to look at ways to shrink our footprint and distribute command and control throughout the theater uh, and, and confuse the adversary's ability to strike at a node. For years we have uh, focused on centralized command and decentralized execution. Well, now we're doing a reverse thought process where we also decentralize the command of these forces as we de further decentralize execution and confuse the adversary's ability to strike at a single node that will qu potentially cripple or delay our ability to deliver effects. Uh, so what I was trying to do yesterday was to control aircraft using a zipper web application called Thresher, which is fairly experimental, uh, but the whole purpose behind it is uh, to provide a proof of concept of the KC-46 as uh, being used as an airborne uh, tactical command and control node in support of ABMS, Advanced Battle Management System. Yep, uh, so the idea uh, behind yesterday and what I was trying to do uh, is to provide a proof of concept for using the KC-46 as an airborne tactical command and control node as part of the ABMS, Advanced Battle Management System. Uh, how I was planning to do that is to control live aircraft F-22s using a SIPR web application called Thresher. Uh, so it's not necessarily um, on a tanker that makes it important. Um, it's more just that ABMS is going to be the future of command and control, and right now they do not have an airborne tactical command and control node. And so the KC-46 is a pretty darn good option for uh, filling that vacancy. Uh, unfortunately, yesterday, at least my portion of it uh, did not go, and that was because of some uh, hardware malfunctions that the uh, KC-46 crew experienced. Yep, um, so I think this might be a case where it's just a bad part that needs to be swapped out and that kind of thing just happens with uh, aircraft operations. 
Um, so I like the idea of using the KC46 as a uh, C2 node, um, but I don't think that the I don't think all the necessary tools are quite there. Uh, for example, I don't think Zipper Thresher is the route that should be pursued uh, as far as controlling aircraft from the KC-46. That being said, uh, I don't think that there currently exists software that would be better. It'd be something that would have to be developed. Different functional groups have kind of uh, stovepiped themselves a little bit, and the whole point of ABMS is for all of us to connect all the dots together, like, it's all domain, but also more fully integrated. So I think that's the, the route forward and what we'll eventually see. Uh, it just needs a little bit of working out still uh, in a lot of different aspects, but um, we're all working hard on it, so. So yeah, this is the ABMS on-ramp, so the Advanced Battle Management System. So right now what we're technically doing is getting a couple of radios, trying to figure out how we can create a cloud-based communication network with the ground agencies. Uh, what this is going to do is going to forward a picture that we have to, let's say, an AOC or to a commander, and they can actually see where their assets are live. Um, we're going to be doing that via an organic system that we have on the KC-46. And then vice versa, we're actually having something called a Voyager E kit. It's an executive communication kit that basically allows VOSIP communication on a SIPR net via a tunnel that goes through Transcom. Um, that Transcom communication from there actually gives them access to other applications, uh, which is similar to a tactical data link where the ABM, the back, can actually access a control fight. Uh, for this test, we were unable to actually get it on, but the KC-46 is one of the very rare and few aircraft that has an onboard military data network. The MDN, we're actually creating a SIPR connection to another link called Thresher, and the ABMs and be the back calling the fight, all while we're doing our AR with the C-17 and playing with F-22s in aerospace. So that's what we're doing today, and we've been doing the last two days. Uh, it's important because of the capabilities that it's providing. So right now, we, they have a picture in the air, usually it's line of sight, and that's from KC-46 to a fighter. What we're giving is a beyond line of sight, so we can push a picture from anywhere in the world, from Afghanistan to AMC there in Scott Air Force Base, and they can actually see what's going on in the fight. We can also see the status of an airfield. If they're ever under attack, we'll be able to tell if they had missile inbounds, uh, damage assessment, uh, are they still open, what's the condition. We can push that live from a jet, from a ground, from a boat, from a car. And so part of this ABMS contract is we're just a small piece in it. On the KC-46, we're going aircraft to aircraft trying to push that capability out.
just what I'm going to tell you. We have last year. We just beat up here. Young Tigers, it's a good effort. And it'll be in the department. Yeah. I had to do a 40 by 60. So the Raptors yesterday were asking if we pull the 10 by 20. I was like, why can't you do that? I was like, I was like, why can't you do that? It's very similar to our. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Half my flight says we're back in like one or two hours. Yeah, it's supposed to give us like a direction. Oh, that's way better. 